uh, Sarah, Ted, and Gino in particular, why don't you just tell everybody where you're at in the world and uh, where you're pastoring from? Gino Allison here. I'm in the south suburbs of Chicago, about 40 minutes from downtown, about maybe 50 minutes or an hour, depending on the day from Ted. And uh, glad to be here today. Yeah, I'm in Chicago too. Uh, I live in Chicago. Our church is in Evanston. It's on the border of Evanston and Chicago. Um, Chicago, greatest city in the world. I'm Sarah Pemberton. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. We pastor the Nashville Vineyard uh, downtown. By the That's good. That's good. And I am in central Kentucky and Melissa is in Orange County, California. Okay. So we'll just go ahead and get started here. This is a webinar calling we're calling Pastoring Your Church Virtually. So we just want to talk about some of the things that we're experiencing as pastors who are suddenly finding ourselves uh, somewhat disconnected from our churches physically and having to do the role of pastor as uh, uh, through a new through new mediums, just almost entirely virtually. So we're going to talk about some of those issues, some of the things we're doing and uh, some of the things we're seeing. So let's just start here. And whoever wants to pick up the question first is totally cool. Uh, here's what I'm wondering. What are we doing to connect with our churches beyond just having weekend streaming services? I know a lot of us are like streaming our services or maybe like Melissa and Vineyard Fullerton, we're doing kind of like Zoom uh, Zoom church on the weekend. I'm wondering, what are you doing besides that to connect? Well, it took me a couple of weeks to start missing, actually a week to start missing like in-person visits. And as we were connecting with people uh, from our church, we really got the sense that people uh, were really grieving the loss of in-person visits. And so a couple of weeks ago, we started doing what we call curbside check-ins where people can email the church uh, office and sign up for a pastoral curbside check-in. So we basically just drive by the house. We stay in our cars. They come about six feet, eight feet, you know, from, and we just visit with them from anywhere from 15 minutes to, you know, half hour or so. Our car, our van is full of kids. So our kids are talking through the window to their kids. And so I mean, I think it does more for us than it does for the people we, we go and visit. But um, that has been really one of the things that's uh, kept some of those um, in-person relationships alive. And on, on Sunday, they they all came by our house just with a parade of cars, you know. And I was just undone as I, I hadn't seen most of those people for for months now, you know. And so um, we, we had to get creative and figure out ways to to... To, to connect with people while still socially distancing. But that's one that I would highly recommend. And even the people that don't take you up on it, they are just so glad that you, you know, willing to make that effort that it's been, it's been really rich here at our church. That's beautiful, Gino. What yeah. a great idea. What a great idea. Sarah, anything in your world? Yeah, in our world, um, when this first started, the first thing we did was just reach out to a bunch of our leaders that were interested in leading things. And we just started a bunch of Bible studies, like N.T. Wright released a free Bible study on Philippians. And so a bunch of our people just started, we passed out the Zoom stuff to everybody and they started just leaders who hadn't led before started leading these Bible studies throughout our church. So we've got a couple of those going. Um, and they're smaller groups and they've opened up to people who haven't joined other groups. So we found that to be a fruitful thing for us. Um, and allowing others who have never led, lead. That's right. Ted, what about you guys in Evanston? Well, we found actually something very similar, like uh, people have space to do maybe some deeper learning. So we actually ran a couple classes, uh, like something that ordinarily we'd want to do like on a Sunday or whatnot, or a Saturday morning, have people in. We ran a class on hearing God's voice and add like way more people at that class probably than we would have if we had just done it in person. And so we found that to be pretty effective. We ran a class on soul care. So just the more didactic, you know, like we're gonna teach you something, uh, give you something to think about, give you something to practice or try, 
that's been helpful. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're attempting to call every person that's visited our church in the last year or so. So um, for people who are members or people who are regulars, we want a call to go out to those folks once every three weeks to four weeks. Um, but then even the people on our fringes, we're attempting to call. And uh, man, people, people like being on the phone right now. It's really odd, really weird. I don't know if the rest of you are doing that, but for us, that's what we're doing. You've been doing that a little bit too, haven't you, Adam? In your yeah, church? we, as soon as this happened, Andrew, our executive pastor, put together a church directory from everyone who's filled out a connect card, everyone who's come to one of our conferences, everyone who's just kind of in our orbit. And then we took one week and as a staff, we went through every sing single name and we went, oh yeah, that person is a part. No, that person just came to an event. That person actually goes to another church, but you know, occasionally pops in here. We just sort of culled through it to get down to what is the actual universe of our church. And then we just split all of those names up uh, into our staff and we called every single person and we're trying to do that every three weeks and it has blessed people like crazy That's pretty and one, awesome. one of the nice things too is a little bit of something that that uh sarah was saying was some people on my staff are meeting people at my church that they've never met if that makes sense uh, I, I don't know if this happens for a lot of you but you especially if you're on staff at a church, you'll end up meeting like the people who are in your little universe. So if you're in worship, you meet all of your worship people, but you don't really know anybody who's in kids church or anything. And that's, that's probably not good. And so this has been nice to get our staff just to know people at a much deeper level. Um, so that's been, that's been one thing. And I, I, I thought it was awesome. Yeah. Uh, the other, the, the other thing I want to say that was just piggybacking off something that Sarah said was um, you were saying that like some people who had never led have led and then Ted said some people came to their groups, maybe more came to the virtual group than would have come otherwise. And Andrew, my executive pastor and I, we were, we were talking, even after all this is over, we think we're going to keep at least one or two virtual home groups going oh, because oh. I think people in their thirties with three kids who could never come to a home group have found that they can go to a virtual home group and it's blessing people. That's mm. good. So that's one thing I just want to throw out. Like maybe we're waking up to, I mean, a lot of the virtual stuff I don't love, but maybe some of the, some of the, the good side is, is that people who couldn't be connected before could. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, well, let me, let me give you another question here that is maybe a bit more pastoral in nature. Uh, I'm, I'm just interested in, what are some of the pastoral issues that are emerging for you in your context uh, because of coronavirus? Well, I think that one thing that this thing has done is it's created a sort of enforced stillness for people. Uh, and I don't know, I think that like a, one of the one of the nice things about distraction is it can actually keep you distracted from internal stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. can keep you distracted from internal pain, um, can keep you distracted from, uh, like internal pain actually between one another. Um, so what we're noticing is we're noticing, um, that that stillness, which kind of feels like grief is actually creating room for people to actually come face to face with some things that are inside of them that are really tough, you know? Um, there are people are responding either one of two ways. The first way that they're responding is they're leaning into it. And usually if they're leaning into it, they it's because they're part of a community. Like they're part of a small group or they're, they're meeting with people regularly and they're really active. Um, but the other like really grave pastoral issue is that um, the other response to that internal pain, frankly, is medication, you know? And so, um, I mean, that medication looks like all sorts of different forms. Um, and, uh, and I mean, I'll just be honest. I think that um, like putting ourselves online, our lives are kind of like hidden from each other. And that gives us space to do things that are pretty dark. So, you know, those are some things that we're wrestling with. Um, 
wrestling with the accessibility to um, to material online that's actually not helpful. It's really harmful. So how do we pass for people through that? Uh, those are big questions that I think we're asking, you know? Um, so it's just, it's not like just putting, planting new things in the garden. It's like weeding a little bit too. I think that's something we're thinking about. Yeah. Sarah, Gina, what are you all seeing right now pastorally that's just kind of popping up in your people? I know for, for us, one of the things like just this week, I really realized with some of our people is there, we were like, I was talking to you guys earlier. There's a pressure right now. Um, just about, you know, like, for example, do you wear a mask? Do you not wear a mask? There's pressure both ways. Um, but just like that, there's pressure in, you know, this time period where all people keep saying, you know, don't waste this time, take advantage of this time, spend time with the Lord. And those are all good things. But sometimes religion sneaks in there and people feel like they've got to do, they've got to read the whole chapter of John within the next hour and then go to like Mark and they got to get this thing done, speak in tongues for an hour and then do this for an hour and then do this, you know, they got can't waste time. And there's this religion aspect that I'm noticing is starting to beat up people. And this week, just, we had to walk people through realizing it's a relationship. It's not, it's not this taskmaster that's beating you over the head saying, if you sit down and, and you read a fun book, then you're not being the most Christian person in the world. And, you know, relationship that has this abuse is abuse if it's this required thing going on um mm -hmm. so just teaching our people to to lean into his presence into the relationship and to accept the gift of freedom that he's giving us you know not be pulled into this this thing you know there's a lot, like ted was saying earlier there's a lot of voices out there right now there's a lot of even what we'd say prophetic voices out there that are trying to push us to be one way or the other and tell us what we should and shouldn't do. And Jesus is just saying, lean into me, lean into me. However that looks, whether you're looking at the birds, if you're walking, you know, the hundred acres of Adam's wine farm or whatever, and then, or, or walking, walking in your neighborhood with, you know, lean into me during this time. I, you know, my yoke is easy, easy and my burden is light. It's not meant to be some kind of Thing. So just teaching our people to embrace his presence, to lean into him, to become a friend of Jesus. It's not about some kind of doing things. So that's good. Yeah, that's good. I thought about the, you know, um, the ways that I need to be preaching to our people right now based on what they're dealing with. And I feel like this is one of those unique situations where everybody's in the same boat but as my wife says we're on the same boat but we might be in a different different storm so to speak but i just feel like as i talk to people and even as i process my own thoughts and emotions that like i think a lot of people are wrestling with the bigness of god right now um, because this seems um bigger than god um in some ways and so i felt compelled to preach big god texts and to deal with um, uh, the emotions and the various seasons of the soul at the same time helping people understand that God is big big and that the presence of pain has never meant throughout the scriptures and all of Christian history has never meant the absence of God in fact God is not only present in pain but he often uses it to do some of his best work so I found that pastorally I have to be appropriately transparent um, while at the same time drawing people back to what's true uh, and using the scriptures uh, uh, to do that. I also feel like pastorally, there are just a lot of needs right now. You know, people are being laid off. Um, you know, my wife was furloughed, furloughed from her job a couple of weeks ago. And so like we're sitting in the reality of that and people uh, are gonna have real financial and resource needs. And so churches dealing so many churches are dealing with a drop in giving and resources themselves but still will be tasked with trying to help people make ends meet and so pastorally that's one of the things that's before us right now for sure yeah gino i i just kind of want to jump off a couple things you said there because that was i think pretty uh pretty accurate for a lot of us i know i know in in my church i've had a couple people ask me this is rooted into your thing where you were saying like big God stuff. Uh, I, I've had several people ask me at my church, basically what they were asking me is how could God let this happen? Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's upset a few people's charismatic apple cart, right? Like, uh, how could God let this happen? Like, we've been praying, you know, I'm an intercessor. We prayed this thing away, but it didn't go away. Now what? <laughs> and uh, I, I think that's been one of the things that sort of like emerged around our place as well, is like, okay, now what? And I loved what you said there. Uh, God can can uh, still be a big God even in the midst of big storms or even big pain. Mm-hmm. I think that's I think that's really insightful. Mm-hmm. I, I'm also wondering just pastorally because I've noticed something at my church, and I just want to know if you guys are seeing this as well. Uh, what about what about loneliness? And and here's what I'm here's what I'm just uh, talking about specifically. Uh, isolation is starting to hit some of my singles. I'm wondering if that's something that's happening at your church or if you have any thoughts on that. It's huge for us. It is huge for us. We have singles, but we also have widows and widowers. And uh, in some ways, in some ways, um, that's, that's even harder, right? So, uh, and this is why for us, we're make, trying to make an effort to show up every day online for something, you know, even if it's just a small sip. Um, and to Gino and your point about big God, I mean, I do think that that's kind of, that's kind of like, at least for me, I, I know that like the preaching burden is to preach that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the thing that, that actually I, in so what you're saying, Gino, that's the thing in conversation with Jesus that I feel like he's told me to do too. You know, um, you got 15 minutes, 20 minutes to preach. This is the thing you should be preaching about, you know, the beauty and the greatness of God, you know. Um, but loneliness is huge. And I don't actually have any answers. I mean, I think that we're attempting to do it. It shows up. I mean, that's the crazy thing about loneliness. People don't necessarily say they're lonely but it shows up in the way people show up in a chat or in a group That's true. or whatnot. Um, and so the way that only thing that we know to do is to call, you know, and, and to pray and, and to meet needs. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't really know what else actually it's tough. Yeah. I feel too, uh, that I don't feel, um, I don't feel the need uh, to preach people happy, <laughs> you know? I feel like, you know, even when we talk about big God, if you look at the scriptures, like there is like seasons, long stretches of pain, long stretches of discomfort and injustice and all sorts of calamity and God's still there, right? And so I feel like if we look at, you know, Psalm, the Psalms and all the scriptures, it like essentially gives us permission to have bad days and to voice our displeasure with the circumstances and even with God, if, 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 I mean, if you want to be honest, right? And so I just don't, I feel like part of this is just, we need to just sit in this with people and our sermons need to sit in this with people and acknowledge that this is horrible, acknowledge that we feel powerless, Mm -hmm. but help people see, help people look up, as we said a couple weeks ago, look up because that's where our help come from, you know? Um, and so I don't feel like I'm supposed to be cracking all kinds of jokes and stuff like that. Some, sometimes it doesn't even feel appropriate to be lighthearted. Sometimes I just feel like as the preacher, and even as we pull up at a curbside visit, just listen and say, yeah, that's, that's, that sucks. That's terrible. Right. I feel like that's mm. some, some, something holy about that. Yeah. I think there's a, I think there's a Bible word for that, Gino. I think it's called lament. Is yeah. yeah. It's in there. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Hey, Melissa, I, I know that uh, that you're in Southern California and you guys are not, uh, you're not impervious to all these issues as, uh, either. I, I'm just wondering, like, what's been your experience so far? Um, all the same. Um, we've actually been teaching on lament in the last several weeks. That's been what, what our pastor Wade has focused on. And we've, we've got a private Facebook group for our community. So we, we hold that private. If you're a member of the community, you're, you're, you can be in it. And so folks are using that daily to communicate with one another. And they can, because it's private, they can be really open. So since we've been preaching on Lament, we found um, several people just 
lamenting on that Facebook page and then allowing each other to, to speak into that, you know, it just allows us to surround them as a community. And so um, uh, that's been really uh, interesting to watch, but encouraging to watch as they are able to communicate what's going on for them, you know, and then allowing us to be a community alongside them, even though we're apart. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Uh, I'm also wondering, are, are we having people in our churches lose their jobs? I know, Gino, you said uh, that even your wife has been furloughed. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else having that happen, Sarah, Ted? Yeah, we have a lot of musicians in our church that they had their whole year booked and now they're out of money. Mm. And um, so a lot of them have returned to their family homes the younger ones just to survive. We've also started a fund in our church for other members to donate. And then we give as the needs arise for mm -hmm. those that didn't see this coming and haven't planned and all that um, to help out those that just need gas or food or mm -hmm. stuff like that. So, and we've also started some videos um, called living through a pandemic where we release them once a week. And one of the people we're interviewing, he's, he's a really well-known electric guitar player and he was booked out and now has nothing. And so it's just talking about mm -hmm. how he can survive. Cool. He can do, and what does he turn his time towards now? And um, so that's helped our community to see the need, to give to the need and to support those going through it. So that's one, some of the stuff we've done, but yeah, we've lost, a lot of people have lost jobs, mm -hmm. uh, specifically the musicians. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Ted, what do you, what do you have? Yeah, well, we're experiencing that too. So um, that's, I think that's, I mean, to your point, Sarah, it's, we're trying to, we're trying to, to ask or to invite people to, if, if they're, they're able to, to be generous, um, to give to our benevolence fund. Uh, because I, I, here's the thing that I do know, what I do know is some front loading is happening right now. Some people are losing their jobs right now, but when this thing ends, it's not like it's, that's going to be over. Yeah. You know, the needs are going to continue to, to, to go on. And so, I mean, like we're hoping that we can get that benevolence fund to, to swell so that it's pretty big. So can we, we can meet yeah. people's needs. You know, I think the hard thing for us is that um, we probably could, I don't know that we know who is in need. We're trying to figure that out. And people can self-select into it, uh, but when you're not together, uh, it it just becomes becomes harder to know how people are really doing. That's true. And so um, that's that's kind of our challenge. Um, our challenge is to stay on, stay connected with all the people that are sort of in our universe, and we found that to be difficult. Um, yeah. I think if if I could say something about the lament thing. I yeah, just think, I wish you would. I, I just think that that um, one of the things that the lament does is that I, I think it creates a sense of solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, it creates a sense of solidarity with people who suffer. Um, I think that all sort of the other solutions to to um, to evil or to hurt or to grief tend to be kind of like a more power oriented. I'm gonna solve that for you, you know, or or, or whatnot, but solidarity comes from lament. And I just think that we do have an opportunity to experience the kind of the solidarity with people who have suffered um, in a way that maybe we haven't before. Um, and, and I think that actually that's, it's a biblical thing. I mean, obviously um, it's directed our preaching. Um, the reason why we're preaching through First Peter is because First Peter is a letter to exiles that are scattered throughout like this missionary route in basically Turkey. Um, and, uh, and speaking of Turkey, we, uh, we are in partnership with Turkey and the kind of the experience that we're having of being like separated from one another, um, sort of not being able to see one another. I mean, I just think of Turkey and like Istanbul is like throttled with people. There's so many people who live in Istanbul and the church is very small. I mean, they're still able to meet, but it's very small. And oftentimes if you're a worshiping house in a region, you may be the only house. And uh, I think it just gives us an opportunity to, to identify, to have solidarity with, and 
uh, with people who like that's in the range of their normal experience, as well as like the early church, you know. And I think there is a message in that. Um, we're still trying to figure out what that is, but there is a message in that. No, I think that's I think that's awesome because part of what I hear you and Gino in particular saying and uh, Melissa is that there's something in Christianity. There's like there's built in muscle memory for for knowing how to process these emotions mm -hmm. if we just connect people to it. Right. Like uh, there's something inside of Christianity that says, you know what, it's OK to call a bad season a bad season. It's OK to take uh, frustration to, directly to God. Mm -hmm. It's OK to call uh, a bad moment a bad moment. We don't have to uh, we don't have to say it's good to be a person of faith. Uh, and uh, that's, I think that's really healthy, actually. So but I mean, I, I mean, I, found, cool. I found that you, everybody's Christian education doesn't have that as a part of the curriculum. So, you know what I'm saying? And so it is a part of a lot of Christians, Christian belief that that's faithlessness or that we have to somehow talk, you know, mm. uh, talk ourselves out of this or, you know, bury our head in the sand rather than, you know, own that this is terrible and I feel like part of our responsibility is to give per people permission to grieve and lament um, and that permission is often granted the way I see it by modeling that you know right now I hey, can't I, get I, up I, go ahead you know I'm sorry no I'm saying I, I don't want to spend 30 minutes just complaining and call that a sermon but I mean there is a measure of me modeling my own grief and lament uh, in a way that is that grants people permission to do that. Well, I wanted to jump in here and I just wanted to, to say something that you jump off of something you just said, uh, Gino. I'm wondering if we could just help people here for a moment and divide between lament and complaint. You, you mean real examples? <laughs> yeah, or even like just, I'm, I'm just saying like, what is the difference between uh, real Christian lament and just being a complainer or yeah. just yeah. being a, a um, just being a downer, you know? Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do in our, in our church and Grant and I do personally, we rarely use the word lament, not that it's a bad word. What we usually say is just be honest. Honest. That's if, good. If you, don't, if you don't, if you aren't honest about where you are um, and you don't acknowledge where you are, real change can't happen. Mm. That's right. And I love that it's hidden mm. so we always tell our people mm. just be honest like if you're not into it today you're not into it today if mm. you know one of the people in our church they just lost their spouse had an, a, a stroke and he passed away in the hospital and she couldn't be there it happened this week and mm. so she's having to be honest with saying why i mean how could this happen where's god in this mm. you know and you just got to be honest you can't fake it you won't change unless you're honest that in a sense is that's lament it's just being honest so that's the difference i'd say between lament and complaining is being yes. honest well jesus can't heal your fake life right right <laughs> right yeah yeah i did a funeral that's last good. week uh this lady did not die from covid but she had had a brain aneurysm she's part of my church and um but because it's covid times only a, a, like a tiny handful of people could come into the service and only a tiny handful of people could come to the graveside service and those were kind of my opening remarks to the family was this really is unfair i just want you to know this is unfair to have to grieve the loss of your mother and it really really touched people because they were feeling it was unfair but they felt like they couldn't say that if yeah that, that makes sense oh, that's, that's right that makes total sense yeah. Uh, hey, I'm wondering if we could just switch gears here real quick. Uh, what can we do? I'm just thinking about like our weekend services. Services. Uh, we're streaming them. Uh, maybe you're pre-recording them, and they're going out on Sundays. I'm wondering. I'm wondering what we could do to make our services have a bit more of a dialogue feel or interaction. What are you doing, or what could we do? Uh, to make it feel like uh, more of a gap, because that's part of what's happening on Sunday morning. Even when I'm, even when I'm preaching on Sunday morning and we're all together, like that sermon is, that's a dialogue between me and those people in the moment, right? Mm 
Mm-hmm. And, and virtually I'm, I'm missing that, you know? And mm-hmm. I'm just wondering what are we doing uh, in our weekend services to create a sense of community in that moment or to create more, of, more interaction? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, I, we have been doing ours live and I mean, we've been doing it from my basement here. So I don't see the comments that come in live because I'm looking into a camera, but people on our team are engaging uh, real, in real time and that's been helpful. But outside of that, I'm not sure how to, how to, how to engage with the comments and stuff like that. But when I go back and look afterwards, it seems that people are tracking with me as if they would, as if they were in, in a real time, you know, like in a real service, but I don't, sh- I'm not sure if there's any other ideas of how- Adam, are you looking at the comments as you're, is your thing live or no? No, we, we, we pre-record ours and, you know, we, we set it to upload and it, you know, pops up and then we all, everybody at the church watches it together. But part of what, what we've done is at least for Heather and I, I normally, you know, preach alone or we have a preaching team and, you know, on a normal Sunday, we just do that. But since this happened, just in an effort to model something that's mm. more dialogical, Heather and I've been doing sermon conversations, which is really different. Right. And then I've been ending my sermons with two or three questions for people to talk with their families about like, Hey, don't get up. Just be a, just, why don't you just spend another 10 minutes with your kids and talk these two questions, you know, That's and good. you know, I'm sure that a lot of people at our church are not doing it, but, but I know some people are, and I've been, I've just been trying to think of what are some other ways that we could engender a moment that creates a connection between the virtual space and the real space in someone's house. So one of the things that we're, one of the things that we're, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. No, I was just saying that idea of them co-preaching and leaving the questions. We have started doing something in our services where we spend five minutes um, doing reading uh, people's Thanksgiving. So uh, people, we have a section in our connect cards uh, where they can write a sentence or two. Uh, we let them know, hey, if you write a sentence in here, we may read it on a Sunday morning. Um, and we'll read, we'll just read from this list. We'll just say, hey, it's time. Um, the Bible tells us to give thanks. Uh, and um, we're just going to read people's thanksgivings. We do it. We read the names. And we say, hey, this person's thankful for this. This person's thankful for this. Our church is on the larger side. And so that's actually made us feel much smaller. Um, to do it. So we insert other names into our, our thing that we're presenting and anybody can actually write. We basically say, whether you're new or you've been here for years, you can just put what you're thankful for and we'll read it. Um, and that's a testimony. I mean, that that is a testimony. And the funny thing is you'd think that like kind of a, a, a reading a bunch of Thanksgivings could seem like, man, are you ignoring the suffering, but it has not read that way for our church. It's actually mm. lifted people's hearts, which I think is interesting. You know, dude, that's a great it, idea, Ted. Can 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 you just talk to me about uh, how you manage that? Like, so you're saying in your so your service is live stream then? We don't do it live stream. We actually okay. do it. We pre-record it. Uh, okay, so you're at you're gathering this Thanksgiving early. Yeah, from our connect cards. Nice. There's a new nice. section in our connect cards where you can just write a sentence or two about what you're thankful for. And it's huge. In our connect card section, it's just really, really big. Um, and so we can't read all of them in one week. We have to like split them up from week to week because we're trying to take about five minutes to do it. Um, That's a good idea, man. It's a good it was Steve's idea. Steve was like, I have an idea. What if we did this? And, and then here's the other thing that I think we realized. We realized um, somewhere early on uh, that maybe the tenor of our online services just felt a little grim, mm. you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, sorry to laugh. I just get that though. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we get on you, and we're just like. You watched it back and you were like, wow, ooh. we're somber. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, just somber. I mean, I was somber. I mean, um, we, some of us we were trying to like memorize our scripts too and look at the camera, you know, and we had all these things in our heads. Like, how do we do this? Well, we're doing it in our homes and, you know, we're just like, just waiting for that moment when a kid's going to blow through the kitchen or whatever. And, um, 
And we just realized maybe this isn't actually what we want these things to feel like. And so we, a few of us just kind of went off to the side after one of our Zoom meetings and we just said, can we think of like just maybe three or four words that would describe the thing that we're actually doing? What do we actually want to do with our services? Do we want them to be hopeful? Do we want them, what, what do we want from them? And then, um, and then this idea pops out about doing Thanksgivings. Um, and we've been doing them and people love them. People respond to them. Um, I think it's, to be honest, I think that being thankful in this time is an act of resistance. And it's kind of like that, that's the kind of kingdom resistance that we all need. And so we've been doing it, people respond to it. And the other thing that we realize is we realize that the dimension of our services, I mean, Evanson Vineyard, Steve Nicholson, Holy Spirit, you know, all of that kind of goes together. We tried to ask ourselves the question, what makes and how can we make our online service just, uh, you know, a little bit more attentive to the work and the power of the spirit. And so um, in that Thanksgiving time, we also will try to share prophetic words. So, hey, some That's of great. our folks, this is what we're hearing. So um, I think Steve, Steve, one day he had like a prophetic word about a particular pain or something like that. And he said, I'm just going to pray for that right now. He prays for it. We get an email like almost immediately after saying, hey, I experienced the power and the presence of God when you were praying for me uh -huh. right away. So we've been just like that five minute section. We do it right after worship. And, and that was the other thing. Well, like we did worship. We realized that going and doing worship and then doing our notices and our announcements right afterward felt kind of like an abrupt left turn. But for us, it feels actually like, hey, we're continuing uh, in this vein of worship by like doing our Thanksgivings and prophetic words and then we do our sermon and then we do our announcements at the end. And that's kind of how we have been constructing our services lately. So, Ted, that's really brilliant. I love that. Yeah, I love that, I love and, I, and it it leads me right into the next thing I wanted to talk to you guys about, which was how do we how do we make some room for doing the stuff virtually? Like, how can we keep on being, you know, vineyard prophetic people, or how can we do healing ministry? So, um, Gino or Sarah, how have you guys tried to keep the 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 role or the participation of the spirit a part of what you're doing? Well, I know for us, like we have healing rooms going new beginner classes going we're in a we're in an interesting situation too when, you know we live stream our videos we also have this thing called country rebel who's pushing our service out through their live stream which is like a couple hundred thousand people and so we've got a lot of new believers when we grant usually ends every sermon with if you are new coming to the faith sign up for one of these things or a sign up genius online and we'll send you a Zoom link. And then we're meeting with people throughout the week in these little Zoom chat rooms and leading them to the Lord. And also, you know, the healing rooms. We've seen a lot of, you know, people just one-on-one. -on -one, and this is, and guys, this is a great idea because you're getting, we'll actually send out to our church and be like, who's never prayed for the sick? Who wants to learn how to pray for the sick? Come join us on the Zoom meeting. We're going to pray for somebody who needs this. And so we're getting other people in our church that have never prayed for the sick to come and join us as we pray for the sick in these online Zoom things. And we're seeing a lot of fruit from that um, just by offering it online and allowing our people to kind of grow in their giftings. Um, so that's what we've been doing. It's just providing those different avenues as we do the sermon. And it's just kind of flashing up on Facebook and as we're doing those online things. That's cool. So, yeah. That's cool. Uh, real quick too on Ted's thing. Um, one of the things that we did, I, I thought was a really good idea is we created a hashtag called because he lives NV, and we asked all of our people in our church to make one minute videos, starting with because he lives, I, and it's doing a testimony story. And so people can go on and like, look through all the hashtag because he lives NV and read people's testimonies of what he's done because he lives and people really grabbed it. I mean, they really, somebody made a music video. Um, I sent it to Melissa. Just somebody went crazy, wrote a song and made a music video. And it was really cute. So it's just- Of course they, of course they did. Yeah. It was, you're, you're just, you're Nashville flexing on us right now. It was unbelievable though. But <laughs> that was just a good way too for people to connect. And then they were responsible when they shared it, they were responsible to lead people in through those questions. Like, you know, when they would share their testimony. So it got them sharing their faith. So- 
Amen. Amen. Gino, you want to jump in there? No, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to the replies because this has been, I mean, the only way we've known that people need prayer or if they receive Christ is that they email us immediately after service. But Sarah, is this Zoom room, it's, it's open while the service is going on? Yes, yeah, so we use Sign Up Genius, and ahead of time, we created a new believers class. So as Grant's preaching, this is being shared simultaneously. Um, just, you know, if you want to sign up for a new believer class. Um, also, if you need healing, sign up for these healings. And they'll have an option on the Sign Up Genius. They'll have different options they can pick for different times throughout the week. And, like, we, we had deliverance, too. We have a deliverance team. So somebody signed up and they <laughs> deliverance online. And it works. <laughs> so it's pretty. I love cool. that. Yeah. So sign up genius. Yeah. We use it a lot and it really helps. And it, it also alleviates you doing everything on Sunday. We have the whole week. That's right. Stuff taken care of. That's right. That's right. So. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Melissa, you have anything you want to add to this, this part of the combo? No, I mean, we, we do church on Zoom and we do breakout rooms. And so um, we had to create a core team really quickly for, for us where we just said, okay, you're our small group leaders every week and every week on our, our Saturday night service, which is when we meet. And then we meet again on Tuesdays. We break into small groups and then people receive prayer within that group. So twice a week we do that. But these are all really great ideas that we could also incorporate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, I want to ask two more questions before we take a few questions from our Q&A box. So if you are on this webinar with us, I hope you're not asking your questions in the chat because we're not going to see them. You should see a button on your computer there somewhere that says Q&A. And if you have a question that you'd like to ask one of the panelists, just drop it in there and we'll get to it here in just a few minutes. All right. Uh, next question I want to ask is this, or maybe not even a question, it could just be a point of discussion for us. Uh, I have a feeling that, that, that the situation we're in right now may not go away quickly. Uh, clearly, the country is going to be opening back up for business uh, here pretty soon. Some states like Georgia have already begun to open up. Melissa lives in Orange County, California. Orange County is already beginning to push the envelope on opening up. But I just have this feeling like church is going to be the last thing that gets added back in a significant way in terms of weekend services. And I'm wondering a couple <laughs> things. Number one, are we, are we letting our people know it could take a little while before church comes back? Uh, that'd be one thing. And then number two, uh, are, we talking with our, are we talking with our staff or our leadership teams about ways that we might be able to leverage gatherings of 10 or gatherings of 50. So, I mean, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking that in the long term, it's gonna take a long time to get back to having our regular church, but I think maybe in June and July, we, we might all get released to have gatherings of 10 and 50. And I'm wondering if we're already brainstorming how to have meaningful church in those kinds of sizes. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear any thoughts that you all have or any discussions you've begun to have at a staff level on, on those, those ideas. Well, generally speaking, Adam, I feel like we all felt that pressure of have to, having to turn something around real quick uh, when all this went down. And I think we all uh, feel like it's wise to avoid that on the, on the other end of this. So yeah, I feel like we live, you know, Ted and I live in um, a, a state that is on the slow release program. Uh, and so I feel like we might be sitting in this for a while. And so when the governor extended the shelter in place, uh, I guess that was last Friday, you know, we scheduled a meeting with our senior leadership team and talked about, okay, now we're launching Zoom small groups because we're going to be in this for a while, you know? So I feel like my instinct is like, we need to be thinking and planning. And even I think Bubba posted an article of like 24 things you need to think of. Half of those things weren't even on my radar. Like, what is it going to yeah. look like when you reopen? If you can only have 50 people in the building, like, do you go to two services soon? So, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we are in Illinois, we don't feel like opening up is happening even within the next four weeks. So we feel like we have a little bit of time, but I told my admin to start like, you know, uh, ordering some hand sanitizer stations and she texted me yesterday she said hey this stuff is on back order until june like right yeah but i feel like now is the time to start planning for those things somebody said we might not 
we might open the church back, uh, but we might not be able to do kids church for a while. And I was like, man, what are we going to do <laughs> without kids church? So I have more questions than I have answers right now. <laughs> Honestly. No, that's that's good, Gino, and I'm glad you're bringing this up. I, I guess part of my reasoning and wanting to ask this question wasn't that we would even necessarily have all the answers here. I just want us on this panel to think, but then also all the people who are watching this yeah. webinar to begin to think, oh my goodness, uh, we probably ought to start working on that now because sure. like you were saying, you know, we all got hit with this and we had four days to invent how to do TV church <laughs> and I don't want to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah or Sarah or Ted, what do, what do you guys have going on? Because I know Tennessee is wide open. They're like, forget it. We're going to open up quick. What's happening? We are. I was telling them, except for our, our county, Davidson, Nashville, because it's just, it's a mess right now. But um, we're doing our own thing. We're kind of going rogue. We're, we're all shut down. But um, one thing, if, if you know my husband, Grant, he's an entrepreneur. We, we talk a lot about what if God is, I'm going to butcher this, but he says this all the time. And I thought it was great. He said, what if God is, is not calling us to make a faster horse, but to build a car? What if this is a reset mm -hmm. and we need to start looking and stop looking at um, this online thing as supplemental and start looking at it as this is it. And then gathering supplemental. We've always looked at church the other way around. You know, do you have online services? No, we don't, but we meet, you know, but what if it's the other way around? We need to start looking at it that way. So we've, we've been planning. We, we, we kind of think that we just love to create things. We do that all the time, church planners. So um, we've been thinking, you know, what if God's calling us to, maybe we will be always online and we meet once a month. What's average attendance in the U.S. right now for church? Once a month. What if that's what we're having to do? You know, what, what if things are changing? So, um, a couple of things that we've been thinking about possibly doing is when we start opening up phase one and go to 10 people or less, we may do the signups for small groups and just say, you have 10 slots. People need to sign up every week and up to the leader's discretion. If they feel comfortable with this, they would open their homes to the 10 slots. Once they're signed up, we need to open up another small group. But that's a good thing because we're raising up leaders. We're, we're making more small groups, you know, and we're providing some organization there for this thing. Um, so that's something we're already thinking about probably doing probably at the end of May, I think is when we're probably going to go into phase one, um, is to do the signups and limit them to the 10 people. But that'll also provide opportunities for small groups to multiply and, and little house churches popping up everywhere. So, yeah. Yeah. Ted, what are your thoughts? Well, Steve and I just started talking about this. So, uh, our church, our church is our church is a little on the bigger side. So for us, if we meet like uh, in fifty people increments, uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna be doing. We're trying to figure out how many we would have to do, and then there's the logistical question of then we would clean everything. How would we clean everything afterward? Um, but I agree with you, Sarah. I think actually the question. I think what you're asked, what what you're saying, and I think it's right. Is the question. Um, what is what is it about what's happening right now that is the new thing that the Lord is calling us into? And mm -hmm. um, what's the new thing that God is doing? And the online online world is like, I mean, we're essentially telling people um, you can experience the presence of God and you can experience prophetic word and you can receive teaching and you can be at church if you're at home watching it on a screen. Mm -hmm. That is church. That's essentially what we're reinforcing to every single person as they watch weekly. And so we're going to need to be online. You're right. Um, we've started talking about it. We are not, we have not figured it out because the, the question about kids, the question about cleaning, the question about social distancing. Okay. We got mm -hmm. 50 people, you know, tell like a bunch of preschoolers, you guys are going to social distance. What are we going to yeah, do? Right. Stick, them in, <laughs> stick them in little bubbles or something and just like roll them around? I mean, we don't actually <laughs> know what to do. What we do know is we know that we will open it up. We'll probably have to ticket. People will probably have to get registered. Yeah. And we will still transmit, um, Not maybe not the first one, but the second one will still be an online experience for people. So if you are like, I know that Adam, you and I were talking about this week. If you're thinking, should I spend this money to make this thing better? Spend the money. Right. Yeah. You know, 
do, do the work yeah. to make the thing that you're doing online better uh, because it will not be money wasted. Yeah, yeah and, I, I, know, I've been I've been encouraging people, you know, who are who have been a little bit reticent to spend a few bucks to make their online presentation better. I've been encouraging them to go ahead and spend the money because you're going to keep using this. It's not going away. Mm -hmm. It's not going away. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we may yeah. have to go to open air services, too. You know, like they're saying there's a huge difference between being stuck indoors and being outdoors with this thing. Mm -hmm. We may need to start thinking tents. We may need to start thinking amphitheaters. We may need to just be creative with these things and be okay to be uncomfortable. Be okay. Maybe we all, with kids will be in with families. You know, this is all very uncomfortable and new territory, but it's also really exciting because you know what, what would happen to a church who doesn't have, and I know this is pushing it, but what would happen to a church who doesn't have a mortgage? You know, what would happen to a church if they weren't in four walls? There's a lot of things that, I mean, are, are silver linings here, I think. Yeah, yeah. What, are we, what, are we, what are we telling people? We're telling people the church is scattered exiles all throughout where you live. And now we're going to go say, hey, come on back. The church is four walls. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean we can't say that. I mean, in some ways, the thing that's actually happening um, is reformation, right? And that's good. But, I mean, I think that what I'm hearing from Gino and Adam and 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 Sarah and Melissa is the thing that I think we're called to do as pastors, which is to discern, discern the thing that God is calling us to in this particular season, and also recognize that he is not silent, and he is not not at work. He's still at work. So it's our job to actually discern what that thing is, and to lean hard into it. And like it or not, online is not, is not the strategy of the enemy. I mean, God is <laughs> I mean, like whatever you think about technology, he is using it and people are getting touched. And so this is the new normal. And what does it look like as a church? I think those are the questions that we're called to ask right that's now. Good. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, I want to ask one more question before we hit our Q&A. Uh, Melissa, do you care to look at the Q&As and get a couple of those uh, questions together while our panelists take one more question from me? That'd be great. Uh, I'm wondering what are some silver linings that you all are experiencing mm -hmm. from this moment? You know, it is a moment of lament in some ways. There's a lot of it that isn't good. Gino's 100% right. We got to give perm people permission. But the other side of it is, if we're being honest, we've probably all experienced some good stuff. And I don't think we should feel guilty about uh, calling the good stuff good. So I'm mm -hmm. just wondering, what are the, what are the silver linings in this for you as a pastor, a church, or even as a family person? Mm. I heard Rich, Rich Nathan say years ago, and, I, and I've used it ever since, he says that crisis is a good editor. <clears throat> and crisis has a way of bringing to the forefront the things that are most important. And even with absence, and, you know, and creating fondness through absence, I think that for me, I just, I mean, been doing church my whole life. And so I haven't ever had an opportunity to miss people or to miss the gathering, right? And so my appreciation for people and the gathering of any kind really is just through the roof. And one of the outworkings of that for me is the people who I am sequestered with here, I just, I appreciate them more, you know? It, it, it helps that I like them and not just love them, right? But time with my family and this extra time with my family and this collective pause that we're, we're all experiencing, despite its frustrations, have just been a real a silver lining uh, for us because, you know, our life was just, we all live very busy lives. We're juggling all kinds of stuff. And so when over half of that stuff just gets wiped from the calendar, uh, it's been a real sweet, uh, uh, a sweet spot for us to just be able to relate to one another. And I think the collective missing of other people and interactions is going to make when we gather again, man, that's going to be what a time we're going to have, right? Can you imagine that first church service back? Even wow. if we can only meet at 25%, that's going to be a time, man. It's going to be, it's going to be fun. <laughs> like, we might have people running the aisles again, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. That's me, man. That's great, Gino. Sarah, what about yeah. you? Silver linings. Silver linings. I've, realized I can homeschool my kids mm. you know like I that used to be a bit I mean I was a teacher in a former life and so I knew I could do that I didn't know I could do it for my own kids and now I have to and I'm doing two different ages 
and we have a well old machine over here. We're mm. getting up, getting things taken care of, and they're still in school. And it's it's been really good, and I can do it. So, and I know a lot of other moms who didn't think they could do it are doing it, and realizing they can do it, and then also realizing what they're learning. You know, people are becoming more informed about what's going into their kids' ears and what they're mm. spending time learning. And I think that's a really good thing. And it, we've had a lot more family time. And it's, it's basically, it's stripped away everything that's not necessary in our lives. And I think that's been a really good thing. Ted. I've also learned to bake sourdough bread. So that's <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Every that's Saturday. Been, that's, been sourdough the, bread. that's been the Every Saturday. <laughs> Amen to that. Ted, well, what I'll, about you? I'll, I'll say uh, on a strategic level, I think that, I mean, this church, the Evanston Vineyard has been around for over 40 years. And what doing church online affords us is a chance to kind of look at the things that we did before that maybe we won't do again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, just to say, do we really need it? Do we really right. need to do everything that we were doing before? Oh. You know, um, and uh, we were in this, um, we were in this talk, uh, or I was just doing this, uh, we were just meeting with some people yesterday, and one of the questions that, uh, there was a little direction exercise, and the question was, um, if God is a wind, and he's blown some things away, what are you grateful for? <laughs> what are some of the things that he's blown away that you're really grateful for? That's good. And I just think like, man, that's such a silver lining. I mean, like I'm asking the question, will we do church? Will we do all this stuff that we did? I mean, this is a chance to do a hard reset yep. on some things that have like cost us tens of thousands of dollars a year. I mean, like, will we do bagels still when we go back to church? <laughs> really? I mean, will people Care really careful. want? Careful. Careful, <laughs> <laughs> You know? Nobody's going to want to cook, um, so. <laughs> Honestly, like, I mean, you know, just, that and then the other thing that I would say is that I would say that I think that and and you know like I've, I talk about this a lot with Adam but I think that like one of the most important missing containers in the life of the church has been spiritual friendship you know I think that we talk a lot about families and caring for our families um, but I just think that that people are rediscovering friends people are actually doing hard work of reconciliation People are just so grateful to get on Zooms with people that they haven't talked mm -hmm. to in ages. And, um, and I think it's the Lord because I think that you can't do life without friends, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's just so easy to say, hey, if you weren't sold on friendship before, you know, you're probably sold on it now. Mm -hmm. And these people are not disposable. These are, these are people that are supposed to walk life with you, you know? <laughs> And the other thing, just small side note, my kids have become vampires. They go to bed like super late. Yeah. So they, they get up super late too. So they, I get some time in the morning. So I'm really happy about that. <laughs> there you go. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, before we shift gears, uh, any silver linings for you? Uh, yeah, you know, actually with us doing the Zoom meetings, we do the randomized um, small groups. So uh, you meet new people every single week. You're just thrown into a group randomly. And uh, that's been one of the things we've heard over and over for our folks is just being able to meet people. Cause you know, you sit in the same spot at church every week, you, you know your circle, but now you're meeting all kinds of people at all kinds of ages, whether they have, you know, what, wherever they're at in life, you're meeting them all. And so I think we've randomized the groups enough by now that we know majority of everyone uh, who's been coming and going. So that's been really good for our folks, which is fun. That's great. Mm -hmm. It's really great. Well, I'll, I'll just throw this in there. Uh, I have four kids. My two older boys are 18 and 16. And before COVID, they were never home. They were either at work or out with their girlfriends or playing soccer. I mean, they just run around, right? And it's been really great to have six uninterrupted weeks with my big boys at home. And they have kept us rolling. Uh, they're so funny. And uh, I already knew this, but it's, it's really nice when you have kids that you love, but you also like them. And yep. you know that as they become adults, that they're not turning into people that other adults don't like. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's been refreshing. 
that's refreshing. All right, hey Melissa, will you pull a question or two from our Q and A that yeah. uh, the panelists might take a swing at? Yeah, I know Sarah touched on this, um, but the topic of evangelism, is there anything else that you guys have, have found in your churches that's happening? Maybe people in their neighborhoods, is there anything you're encouraging your people to do? Just any more ideas and thoughts on evangelism in particular and, and reaching out to new believers or potential believers? I'm listening. <laughs> you know, well, for us, um, we had uh, one family in particular, or this is just for me, but um, who lives in our neighborhood and they had tried our church at one point, but they've got small kids and it just wasn't kind of working because we do, like I said, Saturday nights and, and they had, um, they were looking around for another community and I, I just reached out like, hey, have you guys, right when this happened, have you guys found another community yet? And um, because you really can't do this alone. And they were, they were, well, how do we just jump on a Zoom when everyone will be like, who, who's that? And it's like, there's so many on, like, just jump on. And they have dug into our community since then, you know, and there's others like them that like, they feel like they're a part of something more than they ever did before with our community. And so um, just those simple, small invites into things um, have been something that, that has worked for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Uh, this goes right along with that, Melissa. Uh, I'll just be straight. Like our church doesn't have some big formal evangelistic outreach that we're uh, that we strategized and launched during COVID. Like we're just trying to figure out how do we do regular church right now. But one of the things that has happened is we've become more attentive to the needs that are in our church right now. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, Heather found out that one of our one of our elderly widowed ladies needed her yard taken care of so she grabbed a couple kids our kids went over to her house just started taking care of the backyard yesterday right well two of this lady's neighbors saw them out there working came out and were like what are y'all doing and they're like well we're just taking care of this lady and they're like well why are you guys doing that and heather's like well you know she's a part of our church and we're just taking care of them and then instantly they're like well what's your church what's happening there how are you all doing that? You know, and then all of a sudden Heather had some very, very, very good conversations with people about like Jesus, the love of God, serving neighbors. And it just happened because we were able to become a bit more attentive about who's having needs and, and being able to just go right directly to it and serve. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. It's really, really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa, what else? Um, there's several questions about your connect cards, Ted. How does that work virtually? What does that look like? like okay, so for us, uh, <clears throat> we have like a little survey monkey form or something like that that we fill out. Um, it's like actually embedded in our in our service, so we it's a link you can go to and you can just fill it out online. That's actually the reason why we pushed announcements to the back end of the service because people we didn't want people leaving to fill them out. So, <clears throat> and you know, frankly they this is a new practice for us as a church we just like introduced it in january um and i mean you talk about complaint the difference between complaint and lament is when you give a church connect cards to <laughs> then you will see what the difference is between lament and complaint <laughs> so we started these connect cards and people are like why are we doing this do we fill it out every week and then all of a sudden then we go into covid uh 19 and people are like was that like a prophetic word from the lord connect cards i'm like maybe but but at least it's like an online form that people fill out and then uh one of our our first steps pastor what he does is he works with the intern they compile all of that into a report that we get and then we can we digest that report every wednesday so so just a little online form that we do and i can you could totally go on our website and fill one out if you wanted to you know, Michael Rayburn, you can just fill, your, fill it out, ask or answer some theological questions for us. <laughs> and it's just really easy to do. Yeah. Good. Um, I'm trying to figure out a way to ask this in a, because it's a question about how do you encourage people to sign up for small groups online? Um, but I think there's a bigger kind of picture here is we're seeing, I think, a lot of people in different places emotionally right now, you know, and the, the stages of grief and loss and transition. And 
are there, are, do you guys see that in your churches with different people and, and just kind of, um, you know, we've got where a lot of people think that, why is this even happening? Why do we have to do this, right? Why, this is ridiculous. But then there's those that, that have hunkered down and they haven't left for eight weeks, you know, like there's this whole kind of in between. And so then the people that are wondering, why is this even happening are kind of getting upset at the church, upset with you maybe perhaps. And we've encountered that where people are getting angry that why, is, why can't the church just meet? I don't understand. Like, are you guys um, discovering that in your worlds at all? And, and how are we kind of handling that? I mean, we've, we've found that to be true, but I don't know if that's ever. That's interesting. You know, we're, we are just now seeing a decline in our small group Zoom meetings because I think everybody's getting Zoom fatigued. So, you know, what started off amazing, now we was just like, really? Again, I could just, so it's something that we're having to figure out and we're starting to brainstorm because we're starting to see just some numbers dwindle. Mm -hmm. so, I'm not sure other than to try a different medium, try, you know, reach out, phone call, or I really like, you know, Gino's idea about the curbside. I think that is brilliant, brilliant. People want to see a face and feel human. So. That's awesome. I think the beauty of it too is you don't have to do it if you don't want to. <laughs> right? I feel like everything we offer, we're trying to, you know, create spaces for people who want to gather or people who are missing connection to do it. And those are the people who I believe will, uh, you know, we've been slow to uh, start small groups. In fact, we'll just launch them this coming Monday just because we didn't know how long we would be in this. But now that we see, you know, we, we've had a weekly uh, Zoom prayer meeting that frankly, half the people probably show up just to see people rather than just to pray and there's a little fellowship time afterwards. So we said that we saw that this felt need for small groups um, and in that engagement that people have been missing. And so whoever shows up to that will, will show up to it. But um all we can do really is invite people they'll have to vote with their feet i guess right like i like one just thinking this through and verbal processing you know one thing you could do is do a book club you know or mm -hmm. watch a show on netflix and then everybody meets like you know change it up a bit you know you you can still talk about the main things but you can come together in a way that's a little different you mm -hmm. know think outside the box a little bit I think that uh, just to just to take a stab at this, I think that uh, when it comes to inviting people to small groups or whatnot, to me, inviting people to small groups is the secondary activity. There's a primary activity that I think has to happen first to me, and that's that people are actually in connection with one another relationally. And so I think if you're trying to figure out how do I get small groups going um, and how do we do pastoral care coverage and call people, can I just suggest call people all day long start there because that'll make people feel like and to adam's words that'll make people feel seen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then the invitations ought to come out of that rather than out of the program i think that's part of the thing that god that's is good, doing good. is just kind of reminding us or re-reminding us that the church is not an erection of like a lot of different structures but it really is just people together and calling one another, I think that's where we start. So, yeah. There's a lot of great questions here. I, I, I would say, how are you all caring for yourselves in this? Because there's a whole lot going on. Mm. How are you taking care of yourselves and keeping your, your church life, family balance? You all have kids, right? We all have kids. And everyone here, like there's questions in here about how do you, how do you do this with little kids? But how do you do this? Your whole life now is in your home and you're caring for all the people in your church. What are you doing um, to make sure that you're staying afloat? <laughs> okay, so I'm usually pretty bad at this stuff and I need someone to help me, but I have come up with a new rhythm because the, I don't know about everybody else on this call, but like when COVID started hitting, I wasn't working less i was working more than i'd ever worked in my entire flipping life like oh it was insane so after three weeks of really really hitting it uh i found a new rhythm and i scheduled out a new rhythm and so now what i have is i'm having what i call one really busy week 
and then a less week and then a busy week and then a less week because because I'm doing stuff with my family I'm doing stuff at the church here then I'm doing stuff with the vineyard worship and I'm doing stuff for my podcast like uh like the ferment because I want to keep it going so I'm doing one week where I smash a lot of podcasts and things and then the next week I'm doing a lot less of that so I can just like call people on the phone and be more pastorally available so I'm, I, I had to like just figure out look, what is it that I need to get done and then find a new rhythm and then the, part of the silver lining for me out of this is I actually get a weekend like I've never had weekends off my entire life yeah so this has been wonderful you know that part has been great but uh yeah so giving myself permission to work really hard one week and then giving myself self permission to pull back the next week has been really, really, really helpful. That's good. I agree. Yeah. I know Grant and I work together really well. Um, we look out for each other. We make each other go on walks by ourselves. That has been <laughs> really, really helpful. And we take just these epic walks by ourselves and get away, listen to the birds, allow creation to kind of wipe away the junk and just get out there with the Lord and, and spend time with him. And we look out for each other in that. So every day, when are you going for your walk? When are you getting out? And then we schedule it into our day. Yeah. That's great. My yeah. wife, Shannon, my wife, Shannon has uh, built into our day, um, Either, either family jog or a bike ride you know the kids um we do my crossfit gym does zoom so we have uh zoom uh classes and even they did crossfit kids monday wednesday and friday pe for my kid for my kids so yeah. my kids do it. so i mean it's 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 super hard to eat well you know when you're in the house all day but i feel like one of the things that <laughs> is at least helpful is if you you get out and move at least once a day you know um I don't know, date nights. I don't know how you accomplish a date night in this. So, uh, but I don't know. Meaningful family connections. It's 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 a challenge. It's not low hanging. It's not easy for for by any stretch. Right. But that's a, that's a really good question. I think. Yeah. Well, hey, I think this has been awesome, but uh, I think we've been at it probably long enough. I think an hour and fifteen minutes is about all the Zoom brain any of us need. Right. Oh. Uh, I know that before we started this call, Ted, you had mentioned maybe wanting to pray a benediction over all of these pastors and leaders and worship people. You care to do that? I would love to. Yeah, I'd that'd be awesome. To. So I'm just going to pray the benediction um, from Numbers chapter six. Mm -hmm. So the Lord says to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. All right. So, Wherever you're at right now, um, you could do the vineyard, vineyard pose of receiving if you want to, or you don't have to, but I'll invite you to, you know. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. 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 Hey, thanks for coming to our Zoom webinar. Bless you wherever you're at. And we'll be having other Zoom webinars every Wednesday at 2 o'clock Eastern time. So sign up. We'll send you the link. Peace. Bye.